Ah, the French Revolution, politics, chaos, and public executions as primetime entertainment. Picture this, a massive crowd buzzing with excitement. Some are eating bread because cake is off the menu, and others are placing bets. And in the center of it all is the star of the show, the guillotine. Ding, ding! And here's the ironic part. Before it became the ultimate head-chopping machine, the guillotine had a much more innocent history. Believe it or not, winemakers were using a similar blade mechanism to cut corks. Yep, one moment, it's making wine. The next, it's making widows. But hey, the guillotine was supposed to be the humane alternative to messy executions. Spoiler alert, that backfired. And while we're here, let's tackle an unsettling question. What happens to a head after it's, you know, detached? Once upon a time, executions were brutally inefficient. Imagine you're sentenced to death. Bummer, I know. But now, you're standing on the scaffold, and the executioner swings his axe. And, whoops, he misses by a few inches. Not quite the clean-cut ending you were hoping for, huh? Now, you're just lying there, half decapitated, while the crowd is awkwardly looking away, pretending not to see. Medieval Europe had a real trial-and-error approach to execution. Sometimes it took multiple swings to get the job done. And if your headsman was having an off day, well, you better hope someone had the decency to finish the job quickly. Spoiler alert, they often didn't. Then along comes Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotin, a man with a mission, a dream, a vision for cleaner, more efficient executions. Because nothing screams progress like industrialized beheadings. Guillotin stood up in front of the French National Assembly in 1789, all fired up, and basically said, Gentlemen, why are we still butchering people like it's the Dark Ages? Let's get scientific about this. His proposal, a sharp blade, a precise mechanism, and gravity doing all the work. Fast, reliable, and best of all, equal treatment for all. Whether you were a broke peasant or an overpaid aristocrat, everyone got the same high-quality first-class execution experience. And guess what? The French Revolution was all about equality. They loved it. So, when the reign of terror rolled around, the guillotine wasn't just an execution device. It became the main event. Public squares turned into live-action horror theaters. People came with picnic baskets, brought their kids, and placed bets on whether the condemned would flinch. Because, of course, they did. And then we get to our girl, Charlotte Corday, the assassin of Jean-Paul Marat. She gets the chop, her head lands in the basket, and then, plot twist, her executioner, feeling a little theatrical, lifts her head and slaps her. And what does Charlotte do? Well, she blushes in rage. Or at least, that's what it looked like. The crowd gasps. Did she just react? Was she still in there? Cue centuries of people going, wait, how long does a head stay alive after decapitation? And if you thought that was just a creepy legend, hold on to your neck because science actually tried to find out. Scientists, they just have to know, don't they? If there's a disturbing question no one dared to ask, you can count on science to dig in and find the answer anyway. So naturally, when people started whispering, hey, what if heads actually stay conscious for a bit after the chop? Science was like, only one way to be sure. And thus began one of the weirdest, creepiest chapters in medical experimentation. Let's rewind to the 19th century. Meet Dr. Jean-Baptiste Vincent Laborde, a French scientist who, for reasons unknown to anyone sane, decided to talk to freshly decapitated heads. His technique? He'd shout their names right after execution, and sometimes the heads would react. A blink a slight lip movement, maybe even a twitch that looked like an attempt at speech. Now, was this actual awareness or just some post-mortem muscle spasm? Laborde wasn't sure, but why stop at just yelling? Then came Dr. Gabriel Boria in 1905. He was at the execution of Henri Languille, poor guy, and Boria thought, hey, what if I get a little closer? So, as soon as Languille's head landed in the basket, Boria did what any completely normal person would do. He bent down and said something along the lines, Henri, you there, buddy? And shocker, the eyes opened. Not a random twitch, not a spasm. The eyes focused on him. So, Boria repeated his name. And again, Henri's head locked onto him. That happened three times before the light finally faded from his eyes. Three times. But why attend public executions when you can decapitate heads in a lab? Rats, of course. What did you think I meant? 
Fast forward to 2011, when Dutch researchers decided to get real scientific, they hooked up some unfortunate rats to an electroencephalograph. Yes, that's a real word, which measures brain activity, then SNP. And guess what? Their little rodent brains didn't immediately check out. For a full four seconds, the EEG showed clear signs of consciousness. And over the next minute, the brain slowly faded out like a dying flashlight. So, let's recap. Your severed head has a solid four seconds to process what just happened. A full four seconds of, wait, what? Oh, and then, gradually, everything fades to black. Creepy. Yes, but you know what's even creepier? The fact that some scientists looked at that and thought, what if we just put the head back on and not just back on the same body? Oh no, that would be too normal. What if we swapped heads entirely? Or even more unsettling, what if something had two heads? Of course, scientists weren't about to start with people. So naturally, the first victims, I mean, test subjects were animals. Enter Soviet scientist Vladimir Demikov, a man who saw a perfectly fine dog and thought, needs more head. So, in the 1950s, he went full mad scientist and surgically grafted a second head onto a dog. And guess what? It worked. Well, kind of. The two-headed dogs could drink milk simultaneously, because that's an achievement, I guess. The second head would move, blink, lap up water, right up until the inevitable rejection because, spoiler alert, bodies don't love having extra parts stitched onto them. The longest any of Demikov's creations survived was a month. Not exactly a win for longevity, but hey, science was really out there trying things. But why stop at dogs when you can decapitate monkeys instead? Fast forward to 1970. American scientist Dr. Robert White looked at Demikov's work and thought, Amateur. He wasn't content with just adding a second head. He wanted a full-on head transplant, so he took a monkey's head and plopped it onto a different monkey's body. And here's the mind-blowing part. It woke up. It could see. It could eat. It could follow objects with its eyes. In every way that mattered, the monkey was still in there. Except there was a slight issue. The spinal cord. See, connecting blood vessels, hard but doable. Keeping the brain alive, also manageable. But reattaching the spinal cord. That's where things got tricky. So, the transplanted monkey was alive, but completely paralyzed from the neck down. The body worked, but the head had no way to control it. Imagine being conscious, but trapped in a body that doesn't respond. Yes, not ideal. And just like Demikov's dogs, it didn't survive long. So, of course, the next logical step was humans. Enter Dr. Sergio Canavero, Italian neurosurgeon. Big ideas, bigger ambition. In 2017, he announced loudly, confidently, that he was ready to perform the world's first human head transplant. He had a plan, a technique, and even a volunteer, a Russian man named Valery Spiridonov, who suffered from a degenerative muscle disease and was willing to take the gamble. The plan was to freeze the head, sever the spinal cord very precisely, attach it to a new donor body, and then use a special chemical, polyethylene glycol, to fuse the nerves back together. Sounds easy, right? Just a little cut and paste with some brain surgery thrown in. But here's where reality hits. Turns out ethics boards really don't like it when you propose chopping off someone's head and sewing it onto a different person. Who knew? Canavero was pumped. The scientific community, not so much. Medical professionals called it reckless, dangerous, and wildly unethical, which, to be fair, is kind of a polite way of saying, dude, are you out of your mind? And then the whole thing just fizzled. No volunteers, no green light, no actual human head transplant. Just a lot of press conferences, big claims, and a lingering what if. All right, so head transplants aren't happening anytime soon. Turns out, reattaching a spinal cord is a little harder than snapping Lego pieces together. Who knew? But does that mean science has given up on cheating death? Ha! Not a chance. If we can't physically move a head to a new body, why not just ditch the whole body thing altogether? Enter digital immortality. The idea is that instead of keeping your biological brain, we just copy and paste your entire consciousness into a computer. No physical body needed, just you, living forever inside the cloud. No wrinkles, no aging, no back pain, just pure undying. Wi-Fi connection. Sound like sci-fi? Well, maybe not for long. Let's talk about the big players in the immortality game. First up, Elon Musk. 
Because, of course, it's Elon Musk. If there's an idea that sounds like it belongs in a cyberpunk novel, you bet he's involved. His company, Neuralink, is developing brain-computer interfaces, chips that can be implanted in the brain to connect it directly to a computer. For now, it's focused on helping people with paralysis. But long-term, the goal is full-on brain integration with AI. Once we can interface with computers, uploading consciousness is just the next step, right? Then there's the 2045 initiative. A Russian billionaire named Dmitry Itzkov has been pouring money into what is essentially Project Immortality. He plans to move human minds into robotic bodies, like full-on androids. By 2045, he believes we'll be able to upload consciousness into a machine, giving people a never-ending digital life. So, basically, swap out flesh and bone for circuits and steel, Robocop, but make it existential. And then we've got cryonics. Because if you can't upload your brain yet, why not just freeze it until we figure it out? Companies like Alcor will literally put your body or just your head on ice for a few hundred grand, promising that one day technology will be advanced enough to bring you back. Just imagine, you go to sleep in 2024 and wake up in 2524, hopefully not as a museum exhibit. So here's the real question. Would you rather get a brand new body, a real physical flesh and blood upgrade, or ditch the body altogether and live as a sentient computer program? Imagine waking up inside a server, able to think, communicate, and maybe even surf the web, but without any physical form, no hunger, no pain, just pure data. Kind of cool, kind of terrifying. Drop a comment below, because honestly, I need to know if I should start preparing for a future of cyborg overlords or Wi-Fi ghosts.